Jesse Ed of one of DC's most notorious drug kingpins is waking up at home for the first time in more than three decades. Lewis was released yesterday after serving more than 30 years of a life sentence on drug charges. He was an associate of Rafael Edmund III, and while Lewis got a life sentence, Edmund cut a plea dealer for less time. Said free Tony Lewis till his backwards, and now Tony Lewis Sr. is free. Why was the prison release of a criminal who grew up poverty-stricken and made a couple of bucks for a couple of years selling drugs important enough to make national news for the day? Well, that question has a long answer we're going to get into, but the reason his release, his early release even happened, was due interestingly to the work of his family led by his son Tony Jr., who was just a little boy when his dad went away, along with Rafael Edmund back in the late 80s. And their case was one of the iconic poster children cases for crack and crime in the 1980s, especially in the nation's capital, Washington, D.C. This is a violent city where children learn about drugs and murder early. Disturbances almost nightly. Who's these machine guns? Yeah. You name it. And you're overwhelmed by the drug sweeps and pushers. So are the people who live here. What it's happens? the drugs, the crack, the drugs, the crack. This is a violent city where children learn about drugs and murder early. By 1989, the nation's capital had become the murder capital of the country, and cocaine, by my own calculations, accounted for nearly 2% the U.S. economy, and of course, as we came to know later, the U.S. government had a little something to do with that. We can't give up hope. We can't stop fighting. City Hall under fire. Oh, I've said very publicly that I think that the mayor's a abuser of drugs. This is a combat zone. Having the capital of America be one of the most violent cities in the world was not a good look. For nearly 18 months, the drug-related death toll in and around Washington has risen steadily. Local officials say 80% of the killings arose from disputes in the city's drug trade. You can't have people killed and blood running in the streets of the city like it was some third world capital run by a despot. Similarly, the Bush administration has focused on the city's drug problem. Our most serious problem today is cocaine, and in particular, crack. Who's responsible? Let me tell you straight out. Everyone who uses drugs, everyone who sells drugs, and everyone who looks the other way. Ah, uh, irony of George Bush, who, while director of the CIA, at the very least, oversaw an illegal fundraising operation for the Contra rebels, who were really just a rogues gallery of all types. Its fundraising included selling missiles to Iran in violation of our own arms embargo on this so-called enemy country, Iran, who was at war with our then ally, Saddam Hussein. Did you know that? Uh, but more important to our story here, of course, is the fact the U.S. government and, and its effort to allow the Contras to raise money and subvert Congress's refusal to send them money at least turned a blind eye to major drug trafficking or organizations including Medellin, as long as somehow some money made it into the pockets of the counters so they could buy weapons and whatever else. You may be familiar with the case from the story of Freeway Ricky Ross and his counter dope connection. Now, Freeway Rick certainly was not the only and not even the biggest cocaine dealer, but he was a key link between thousands and thousands of bricks and the street gangs of L.A., who were part of spreading cheap cocaine across a lot of the West and the South. And of course, they brought the Bloods and Crips with them, which are still with many communities where they were not born. And it wasn't because of a rap song. It was because the Bloods and especially the Crips had the cheap cocaine. 150 people on the payroll. They were young and never in hiding. On the contrary, they were living large friends and girlfriends and shopping sprees to the best stores in Georgetown. They dropped $457,000 in one store. Something had to be done and looked bad. And in the District of Columbia, Rafael Edmond, Tony Lewis Sr., and a bunch of other people, including quite a few of Rafael's 
very close family member like his sisters and his mother were swept up in an indictment. Edmund's unsuspecting mother talked at a local restaurant with a friend, a friend who had agreed to wear a wire for the prosecution. You know, like he was going hand in hand, coming, him and Johnny, on the corner, and they were selling, so they were getting it done. Right. And then, he just, they just got to see, he just started, went out on his own. Which is what the war on drugs was. What's a spectacle? Well, you've heard the Roman emperor said, let them have bread and circuses, give them a little something to eat, Keep their mind off what's going on with entertainment. You can smoke crack, or you can watch us arrest people for selling crack. But what is that distracting us from? The Rayful Edmund trial is a classic media spectacle with the defenders being flown in via military helicopter and the anonymous jury sealed by bulletproof glass inside the courtroom to protect them, presumably from what? Rayful Edmund's hit team? Well, he didn't have one. Only people in the courtroom to be scared of or think all this is for can be the defendants. The jury found Edmund guilty of a massive drug. Edmund was so powerful and so dangerous, the jury in his trial had to sit behind bulletproof glass. Their identities hidden from the public for their own safety. Can't believe this didn't prejudice the jury, which is not that it would have made a difference. The evidence that Tony Lewis Sr. had helped Rayful turn D.C. into Crack City was overwhelming. Tony Lewis Sr.'s primary role was interacting with L.A. gang member Melvin Butler, who was connected to Brian Bennett of L.A., probably the biggest African-American coke dealer ever. And Rayful got life no parole, so did Lewis, uh, and he pled he, he was found guilty of being responsible, bringing thousands and thousands of kilos into the district. Following his conviction as a drug kingpin, Edmund was sentenced to two life terms without the possibility of parole. But within just days of his arrival, he was back in business. Now, here we come to the point or the lesson of this story, or maybe just something to think about. Ray Philippe grew up middle class. He was the kingpin, Tony Lewis, and a bunch of the other people were poor people in, the, in D.C. who saw a money-making opportunity. You know, my father... Um, first of all, somebody is incredibly accountable and remorseful for the decisions that he made. Um, you know, growing up on Hanover Place, uh, you know, poverty-stricken community, uh, it's, not, it's not an excuse, but got involved into a criminal lifestyle early in his life and as a boy, and just grew um, into that. And at 26, uh, he went to prison to pay his debt to society, um, but he got the sins of life without the possibility of parole. Um, so this is not about my dad being innocent, but it's about the fact that he was overly sentenced. Um, not just him, but uh, tens of thousands of black and brown Americans um, across the country due to uh, draconian federal sentencing. Uh, Rayful had his family doing it. Supposedly, you know, he learned how to sell drugs from his mother and father who were employed with good federal government jobs and made money on the side selling pills and other stuff. Boothe Perry is the unlikely matriarch of Washington's most prominent crime family. Before she got locked up, she had a $40,000 a year job in the federal government. So you, you got your kids educated, you made sure they went to church, you had a good job, your ex-husband had a good yeah, job. he had a job. He worked for the government. He worked for the government. You were middle class people. Yeah. He was not raised in the inner city, he lived in the suburbs. No. Safe place. Yeah. How many of your children are in jail? Six. You had seven kids and six are in jail. You're in jail? Yeah. Come on. What happened? I can't really say, and I think basically I'm in here only because I knew what was going on. She was a mom to me, but also she was a personal friend to me. So when things, you know, selling drugs, and I told you before, so many things go wrong. People get killed, people lose their jobs, people get strung out, and whenever things go wrong or things don't go right in my life, she was my friend. I go talk to her and tell her about all these things, about what's going on with me, and she knew about all that. And she ended up telling all the things that I told her to on informant on a wiretap, and, and that made her be part of the conspiracy. Well, it was more than that. Bootsy admits she once counted her son's drug money, and she accepted a car, a house, and other gifts purchased with his drug proceeds. My mother always wanted a nice big house, you know, so I wanted to be able to buy that for her one day. She always wanted a Mercedes. I wanted to be able to buy that for her. So they were a criminal family 
choosing to be engaged in crime, not because of poverty, whereas I think Tony Lewis Sr. and a lot of their workers, at least in part, uh, were poor people who saw an opportunity. When Edmund was a child, both his parents sold drugs. The father allegedly heroin. Boothy says she sold diet pills and admits she sometimes had Rafel handle the money. But she blames his friends for getting him into the drug trade. He saw the fast money, or he saw them driving big cars, and he, they, he said, hey, man, how did you do this? So how did you get this? Yeah. For money. Yeah, for money. Or greed. Just say greed. You have to say greed. This is your watch. There it used to be my watch. Used to be your watch. There. The government now has its watch. Yeah, the government owns it now. How much did this watch cost? Oh, uh, close to 100000 Is it typical of what you would buy when it's you were... Typical thing that I would buy when I was home. Well, you were fancy. Yeah, I was, I was a little dazzy. Yeah, I like, I like, you know, try to have a lot of class. Did you wear a lot of diamonds on your uh, I wasn't, I wasn't, I just had one carat. I just had a 10 carat diamond ring. Oh. A three carat for my ear and just a, a diamond chain and master watch. Very simple. Yeah, just, you know, simple, but... Rafel's still in prison despite telling, as everyone knows, and we're going to get to that part. Tony Lewis Sr. just got out. He did a long time, but... He got in prison and he decided to rehabilitate himself. His son became a big community activist. In fact, he was the one interviewed about the whole D.C. situation when the American Gangster did the Rayful Edmund special. But Rayful Edmund wasn't rehabilitating him his, himself, at least in the beginning of a sentence. He was trying to sell more dope, which is what he did from his Lewisburg prison cell. Thrown in with criminals like Osvaldo Trujillo Blanco, or as Edmund knew him, Chicky, a convicted drug felon. He had a high-profile case. I had a high-profile case. So, you know, we were just wanting somebody to introduce us. We, we were waiting for a person to come along and say, this Chicky, Chicky, this Ray. We just about everybody inside the jail in some way, shape, form, or fashion is dealing in drugs, either directly or indirectly. He also masterminded the shipment of more than two tons of cocaine and crack from the coca fields of Colombia to the District of Columbia. In some ways, he's like the Babe Ruth of crack dealers. Eric Holder, the Deputy Attorney General of the United States, was, until recently, the top prosecutor in Washington, D.C. It was his office that locked Edmund up in the first place. Tell us the magnitude of his operation from inside the prison. If you look at it on a monthly basis, he was exceeding that which he did when he was running what, to that time, had been the largest drug operation in Washington, D.C. history. He was doing more from in prison? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, at the maximum, at its maximum, he was doing about 400 kilograms of uh, cocaine per month while in prison and while on the street. He was doing about 300 at its maximum. Edmund says it was easy to do from behind bars. Um, I think it's much easier than when you're on the street. In your ears and on the street? Much easier because you're right there with the people that have direct access to the narcotics that you need. Colombians, Cubans, Mexicans. All thrown in together? All thrown in together. Thrown in with criminals like Osvaldo Trujillo Blanco, or as Edmund knew him, Chicky, a convicted drug felon. He had a high profile case. I had a high profile case. So, you know, we were just wanting somebody to introduce us. We, we were waiting for a person to come along and say, this Chicky, Chicky, this Ray. And we just don't go from there. It was right there. What else? You know, what else? What else could we do? It's right there. Chicky is cocaine royalty, son of Griselda Trujillo Blanco, better known as the godmother of the Colombian drug underworld, and a founding member of the notorious Medellin drug cartel. So they were a criminal family choosing to be engaged in crime, not because of poverty. Whereas I think Tony Lewis Sr. and a lot of their workers at least in part, uh, were poor people who saw an opportunity. Now, Rafel's still in prison despite telling, as everyone knows, and we're going to get to that part. Tony Lewis Sr. just got out. He did a long time, but he got in prison and he decided to rehabilitate himself. His son became a big community activist. In fact, he was the one interviewed about the whole D.C. situation when the American Gangster did the Rayful Edmund special. But Rayful Edmund wasn't rehabilitating him his, himself, at least in the beginning of a sentence. He was trying to sell more dope, which is what he did from his Lewisburg prison cell. 
This time his plug wasn't another black male, but a Colombian, the son of uh, Michelle Blanco, Cheeky. She was the only female founding member of the Medellin Cartel and probably one of the two or three top receivers and distributors of cocaine in the United States soil ever. Some people are criminals by attention, barely ready for Edmund, and some people try to make a change. And do like Tony Lewis Sr., maybe that's karma rewarding him. He actually beat Rayful Edmund home. So in prison, Rayful orchestrated the shipment of more dope into D.C. than he did when he was on the streets, courtesy of the new friends he made in Lewisburg. Eventually, the feds made a case on Ray, probably figured he had nothing to lose, and maybe hoped he could make enough money to buy his way out of prison somehow. But he did, in the end, when they got caught, have something to, something to gain by making a deal with the government. He called people on the jail phone, set up cocaine deals with Colombian suppliers who were actually feds. Bunch of people got long sentences. That's what everybody in D.C. hates him for. He got his mother some type of sentence reduction out of the 24 years. Some of his sisters, but a bunch of other people lost their family members in exchange. So the feds have put him in a little known witness protection program for convicts. So I would, he lives under an alias in a different prison where it's hoped those he betrayed won't find it. But if he's hiding out, why is he talking to us? He says he wants the kids in Washington, D.C., who see him as a hero, to know that what he did was wrong. A lot of my friends from my neighborhood lost their lives because I brought drugs in the community. You know, the crack people babies. dying. Crack babies. Some baby probably was going from crack because of me. Yeah, I feel bad about the name, but back there, you know, I was, I was just thinking about the power. For 20 years, the D.C. United States attorney said his cooperation had been both deep and wide. He discussed cold case murders, participated in reverse undercover drug sting operations. It ultimately all led the attorney's office to ask a judge to consider reducing the 54-year-old's life sentence for his D.C. crimes to an unspecified term. Now it's up to a judge to see if that should happen.